If you have your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 4. The year is 1933. 15 million Americans, 25% of the workforce, were out of work. Half the country's banks had failed. The stock market uh, four years earlier had crashed and had not recovered. Millions were lost. Jobs were nowhere to be found. People were hungry. Food lines were around corners. People were waiting in lines for, for forever to get food. People were, families were, were, were begging for food. People were lost and desperate. People were looking for answers. People had no hope. This was the state of the country in the middle of the Great Depression. We look outside our windows and we see our country is vastly in a different state. But at the same time, we look outside and we see that we have our own struggles, our own challenges. Gas prices are high. Uh, it's at this moment that I'm grateful that I'm not in California, where it is over $5 a gallon. Uh, the grocery bill has, increasing, has increased. Mortgage rates are increasing. Inflation is through the roof. And the almighty dollar doesn't seem to be stretching or going as far. Looking around at our country, families are broken, people are confused, ideas and ideologies are flipping the world upside down, calling right wrong, celebrating what is wrong and calling it right. People are upset over every decision that is made at the governmental level. As one side celebrates, the other side calls for reform and is outraged. The country is completely polar. People are not just adamantly opposed to the alternate viewpoint, in our day and age, people are adamantly opposed to the other person. And it seems like the, the thing that is farthest from reality is peace. Peace in the Middle East, peace between Russia and Ukraine, peace between political parties, peace between Californians and Texans. Or, in, in my life, peace because a, a toddler is throwing temper tantrums. Yes, she's two, she's curly-headed, she's cutie, but she can throw a temper tantrum, pray for me, right? Peace uh, for you who have teenagers. How many of you get the eye rolls? Yes, you know this eye roll? Peace when you have three teenagers needing to go to three different locations at the same time. In our day and age, in our world, in our society, peace seems to be a pipe dream. Whether your boss is harping on you about a deadline for a project, a mom trying just to get kids to their next thing, or a teenager trying to navigate the realm of high school. How can we have peace in our world today? Over 30% of all Americans have been diagnosed with some sort of anxiety. 30%. Peace is far from reality for many people. And that's not even to mention the, the internal struggles that people face on a daily basis. The shame of a past decision that's still haunting you. The, the doubt of a choice that you've made uh, that, that you're still wrestling over. Did I make the right decision? The, the bitterness in the heart of, of, of unforgiveness because someone has hurt you and you're still holding on and you're, the, this bitterness is growing. The fear of the future because we really have no idea what's going to happen our desire to have control over our life or over our situations, the guilt of a sin that, is, that, is, that keeps taunting and keeps perpetually coming up and we thought we've dealt with, but it keeps coming back. Anxiety, fear, turmoil, chaos. This is what the enemy thrives on. This is what the enemy wishes for you. He wants to keep you doubting. He wants to keep you afraid. He wants to keep you full of guilt and shame. He wants to keep you in pain, bitter, angry, and surrounded by chaos. But I want to look at a passage today that I think will help us. Because we serve a God not of chaos. We serve a God of peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Peace. Because for the Christian, for the Christian, for the one who has put their faith and trust in Jesus and his work on the cross, for the Christian, our biggest problem has been paid for. Our biggest war has been settled. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our biggest war, our biggest problem, our biggest issue is settled. We are no longer enemies of God. We are no longer uh, uh, on the outside of God. We are no longer have this chasm between God and us. But, but Jesus paid the penalty and ushered us into the family of God, and we are his friend. Amen. We are adopted sons and daughters of the King. Through Jesus, we have peace with God. Now, you might be sitting there to, and thinking to yourself, that's great, Pastor Justin. I, I understand that I have peace with God, but, but I don't feel that peace. You ever been in situations where the circumstances of life uh, uh, are, are surrounding and you, and you just you become overwhelmed with anxiety or worry or fear? Whether that's a questioning job situation or uh, yesterday, my uh, infant right here took a head dive off of a bed, right? Circumstances surround us all the time where, where worry, fear, anxiety, they just skyrocket through the roof and you think, what is going on? You might be thinking to yourself, I know I'm supposed to trust God. I know that God is in control, but, but I'm still overwhelmed by my circumstance. How am I to live in the peace of God? That's the question. Today in our text in Philippians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, open it there. That is the question that we are asking. That is the question that I'm hoping to answer. How are we to live in the peace of God? If God is a God of peace, if, if Jesus says in John chapter 14 that, that the, my peace I give to you, how do we live in that? The main idea, the main point, the main thought of today is the God of peace guards our heart, guards us with his peace and with his presence. So if you would, would you please stand with me as we read Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. This is a passage that many of you have probably uh, are familiar with, especially if you've ever dealt with any sort of anxiety, fear, or pain, or, or struggles where you feel like the, the world is surrounding you, the collapsing around you. you. You've probably read this passage. So I want you to look at this passage afresh to this morning, recognize that God is speaking through his word, and that he wants you to know him, not just to know more things about him, but to draw close to him. Read it with me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I want you to notice just before we sit down these, these two thoughts about the peace of God. The end of verse 7, it says, the, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. And then at the end of verse 9, the, the God of peace will be with you. So what Paul is talking about here is the circumstances of life, God wants us to live in his peace, regardless of what's going on. And I think Paul gives us some practical steps to get there. So would you pray with me before you are seated? God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the God of peace. You're not a God of chaos. You are in constant control. You are sovereign over all things. You are the king of the universe. Nothing happens outside of your control. Nothing happens outside of your will. Your word promises that, that those who are in your hand, nothing can snatch us out of it. Your word promises that nothing can separate us from your love. Your son promised that he would give us his, speak, his peace. So God, for, for the Christian in this room, help us to recognize that. Help us to understand that. Help us to walk through this life living in your peace. 
Help us to walk through this life recognizing and having your peace guard our heart and our mind. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It was just a couple months ago. I have a six-month-old. She's right there. She's really cute and pudgy. Um, it was about six months ago, five months ago when she was born that I had uh, an 18-month-old and a one-month-old in my arms, and both of them were crying because that's what babies do. And, and this thought just struck me. I'm not an emotional guy. I don't cry. I think my wife could probably attest that I've, she's probably seen me cry maybe three times in our relationship. I, I don't cry. I, I'm very calm. I'm very steady. I, nothing shakes me very much. But it's in that moment as, as a, a, a new father of two girls and I'm holding both of them and they're both crying and there's nothing I can do to really stop it. That this wave of anxiety, this wave of fear, this wave of, uh, uh, of inadequacy hits me and I think I'm not enough. I'm not enough to be uh, the husband that my wife needs me to be. I'm not enough to be the father that my infant needs me to be. I'm not, a, I'm not enough. And this, this, this moment of, of fear and worry and anxiety drove me to the Scripture. It drove me to Philippians chapter 4 because I know, I know in the depths of my soul that God is a God of peace. So why am I not feeling that? And so I began to read this passage. I began to read and study and, and think about this passage. And, and this is kind of the, the fruit of that study is what you're going to see, what you're going to hear. Number one on your notes, the peace of God guards you. That's what it says, right? The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. We've all been there. When the circumstances are overwhelming us, when we feel like throwing our hands up in the air and giving up, when, when we don't see how the bill is going to get paid that month, or we don't see how good is going to come from a terrible situation, or when we're at the bedside of a loved one and we, we're not ready to say goodbye, we've all been there. When we're getting ready to leave for college and we feel uneasy or unsure or uncertain about the choices we've made. When we're sleep deprived because our children are, are, are awake and screaming all night and there's nothing that we can do to solve the problem. We've all been there when peace is far from our heart. We're restless, anxious, fearful, angry, scared, worried. We've all been there. And Paul instructs us in Philippians chapter 4 how to live out our faith. Because he gives us specific truths that anchor us to the gospel, that anchor us to the truth of who God is and what he has done through Jesus and is in, on the cross. Because Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27, as he's talking to his disciples that he's about to leave and he says, it's better that I go. And his disciples are like, wait, what? What do you mean it's better that you leave? How is that even possible? And he says, it's better that I go because I will send you another. And in John 14, verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Now, Paul gives us specific principles and steps to take so that that truth, that reality, we can live in. Verse 4, Philippians chapter 4, first, the first thing that we have to do when we feel like our world is collapsing, when we feel the circumstances of life piling on top of us, when we have this spirit of anxiety and worry and fear, number one, first, rejoice. It's a simple concept. We understand it. We read it in the scripture all the time. But this is what he says. This, is, this command is continuous. It, it's perpetual. This is something that not just happens once in a while. It's a constant, every day, every time, every minute, every second of the day type of thing. Rejoice always. Not just when big victories happen, not just when small things happen, but always. Amen. And then it's emphatic. He says, just in case you forgot, just in case you missed it, just in case you read past that too quick, let me say it again. Again, I say, rejoice. This is the first thing as Christians we are to do when life is overwhelming. And it's the first, it's, it's usually the farthest thing from our mind. When we, fear, worry, anxiety are, 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 are pummeling our heart, joy is usually very far away. And Paul says, take a second, take a step back, take a breath, 
and remember who God is. Because joy, joy is not circumstantial. Happiness is circumstantial. Something good happens to you, happy. Something bad happens to you, sad. That's, that's normal. Joy is not circumstantial. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a positional reality of who we are in Christ. And the promises of the Scripture means that never changes. That means no matter what, we can rejoice. Because joy is positional. So we ask ourselves the question. Take a step back and you ask yourselves the question. Am I in Jesus? Yes? Okay. Take a breath. Do I have the Spirit of God within me? Yes? Okay, take a breath. Am I united to Christ? Yes? Take a breath. Rejoice in the Lord. I mean, the fact that Paul is writing from a Roman prison to the church of Philippians and he's encouraging them says something, right? He wants to encourage them to keep their position in Christ at the center of their mind. The enemy wants to throw chaos at us. The enemy wants us, our mind and our heart, to be constantly uh, cycling through turmoil and shame and guilt and pain and worry and anger. Paul says, hold on a second. What should be at the center? It's where you are in Christ. There's no situation that is beyond God. There's no circumstance that is outside of God's control. He has not forgotten you. He has not made a mistake. He is working in you and through you. So Christian, rejoice. The second step is to respond. The interesting thing about Paul's writing, which I love, is he is very practical. He's very practical. He lays steps out. First, rejoice. Second, respond. Because in our mind, we say rejoice. We think, okay, great, but my problem is still there right? It doesn't change anything. Joy doesn't magically make the bill get paid. Joy doesn't magically make uh, our loved one get better. The, the, The circumstance hasn't changed. And Paul says, first, joy. First, rejoice. Remember where you are in Christ, the reality of who you are in Jesus the truth of the gospel, the reality of the gospel. How many of you have ever seen one of those giant gravity wells? You put a coin on it, it spins around and around and around, one of these things. Have you seen these? Have you been, done these? Gravity, it's fun. Um, also, it doesn't lose. Um, gravity, right? The coin, as you put it there, uh, it's going to spin around this well over and over and over and over and over and over again, over and over and over again, right? Unless it's acted upon by an outside force. You have to stop it. You have to pull it. You have to, you have to put your hand on it or else it'll just keep spinning around and around and around. And it's designed uh, with this slope to, to spin faster and faster and faster. And kids love it. But the outside force that stops the spiral, our minds do the same thing, do they not? We spiral. One thing mounts and leads to another and, and the negativity and, and the focus of our mind and our attention, it, it, we, we begin to spiral. Paul says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Paul Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. That stops the spiral. But the second thing we have to do is we have to respond. We have to be reasonable. Some translations say gentle. We have to be gracious. Remembering the joy of the Lord stops it, but being reasonable helps us surpass it. The word in Philippians, the the word reasonableness, it's it's a hard word to translate, but it's the idea of having a level mind that doesn't react in hardship, but responds based upon the truth of the Lord. So Paul says, the first thing you have to do is remember who you are in Christ. Remember your position. Rejoice in the Lord. Take a step back. Take a breath. Remember who you are. Remember who God is. Remember who your God is. Remember that you're in him. That brings joy. Now respond. Respond Christ-like, who under attack never retaliated. This response gets us on the right track. This response, this reasonableness, this gentleness, this graciousness puts us back on the path of righteousness. 
But how many of you, like me, are, get really easy and kicked back into the gutter, get backed into the spiral of despair? We, we have a moment of victory. We have a moment of, okay, we're going to do something, and then another bill hits you, and you're like, whoa! Yeah? Just me? No? You too? Okay. Just wondering. Because the problem is, however, the circumstance is still here. Whether it's a pain or a, a sickness or, or, or another tragedy or whatever it is, you look outside and the country is still in the state that the country is in. I may have stopped the spiral for a moment and responded graciously in a moment, but I'm still prone to reverting back to a, the same spiral. So here's where Paul's third command comes in. Third, first, rejoice. Second, respond. Third, retreat. The first two commands are immediate in the middle of the circumstance, and, and they, they help us face the, the, the spiral of despair and anxiety right then and right there. The third not only helps prevent us from going back into the spiral, but it helps us prevent the spiral altogether. Retreat in prayer. Paul says, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Don't you love when he throws those superlatives in there? Anything? It's not just like, don't, don't be anxious about the giant things of life because God's got that. But those little things, you go ahead and worry about those things. Or, or the flip, right? Don't worry about the little things. God's going to take care of that. But those big things, well, it's too big for God. Right? We say it and we laugh because it's, it's ridiculous. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, here's an interesting question. Is anxiety a sin? Are emotions sinful? If you ask me, I would say yes and no. I know, very helpful, right? Let me explain. The spirit of anxiety is sinful. A spirit of anxiousness, a, of lack of trust in God, uh, of not trusting in God's sovereignty and control, yeah, that's a sinful spirit. But I would add the ca caveat that our emotions in and of, of themselves are a natural response to circumstance. The question is, what do we do next? What do we do next? Sadness, anger, grief, worry, fear. These are all natural emotions. They are all natural responses to circumstance. But each of them, including anxiety, can become very sinful very quickly. Uh, as I was reading this week, one, one author put it this way. He said, concern, worry, plus unbelief equals sinful anxiety. Concern, worry, plus faith equals trust and peace. You think about Jesus. You might think Jesus wasn't anxious about anything. Think about Jesus in the garden, right before he was betrayed, right before he goes to the cross. He says that his soul was sorrowful to the point of death. He was sweating drops of blood. He wasn't anxious. He was beyond anxious. He wasn't sinning. Why? Because his emotion was driving him to the, foot of G, or to the foot of God. His emotion was driving him into the presence of his Father. He's not running from God. He's running to God. And this is what Paul's remedy is as well. He says, don't be anxious, but go to Jesus. Don't be anxious. Run to prayer. Retreat in prayer. In the spiral of our thoughts, our anxiety can become sinful very quickly. Joy is what stops it. Gentle, gracious response brings us out of it. And prayer guards us from entering it again. That's what he says, right? In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Again, remembering, keeping joy in mind. Make your requests be made known to God. It's in those moments of anxiousness. It's in those moments of un not understanding how good is going to come from a circumstance or a situation. It's in those moments that we pour out our heart to God. That we cry out to Him. That we let Him know our fears, our worries, our anxieties, our pains. 
And the promise is that the peace of God will guard our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. The peace that surpasses understanding. You want to know why it surpasses understanding? Because the circumstance hasn't changed. You still are facing the same bill. You're still facing the same ailment. You are still facing the same circumstance that you were at the very beginning of this process. The difference is, as we go to God, as we, we, we reorient our minds, we turn to the Lord, we rejoice in who He is, we respond graciously and kind and, and, and reasonable, and then we go to the Lord in prayer. God promises to guard our heart and our mind. Our mind is shifted from focusing on our circumstance, on ourself, to focusing on who God is and what He has done for us. To the world, it makes no sense. Fear, anxiety, grief, worry, it's what, it's what drives the world. I remember just about two months ago, while this sanctuary was being under construction, I had 350 kids signed up for a VBS. We were supposed to meet and do all of our main uh, things in this room. And if you walked in here on Friday, uh, it was chaos. There was things falling off the ceiling. They were painting and uh, there was sheets of plastic all over the place. There was no chairs. Uh, it, it was chaotic, right? People would come up to me and be like, are we going to be able to use the sanctuary? Uh, yeah, we're, we're supposed to. Well, when are we going to get in there? I don't know yet. <laughs> like, aren't we supposed to be in there on Monday? Like, that's when it starts, right? I'm like, yeah. It's Friday. Yeah, I understand. Uh, our drama our, uh, leader came up to me and was like, I don't know if we're going to be in there. I was like, don't, don't you worry about that. Let me worry about that. You just keep decorating the foyer. And then the fire marshal came and told us we had to take things down. Don't worry about that. Just follow what the fire marshal says. It'll be fine. Saturday comes along, still construction. Sunday morning comes along, I, I get here early, I walk in, I think, well, I can't decorate yet. I'm like, isn't this starting on Monday? Yeah. 350 kids who are going to hear the gospel right here where you're sitting? Yeah. This, this year, we were talking about the armor of God. And at our, at our volunteer training, before the construction even uh, started that week, at the volunteer training, I told the, the volunteers... I said, we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling against the spiritual forces of evil. Which means this week, you, volunteer, are going to be attacked. Thanks for signing up, right? <laughs> your, your spouse is going to come to you with a, a grievance that you didn't even see coming. You're going to get into a fight this week. Your boss is going to be a jerk to you. Uh, you're going to have to get to nine different places at once. You're going to leave work, come to, to VBS that evening. You're going to be stressed out of your mind. You're going to be tired. And, and a third grader is going to drive you to the wit's end. Right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil. The enemy hates what we're about to do. The enemy hates that we are a gospel-centered church that loves to proclaim the good news of Jesus. So it's in those moments that we retreat in prayer, we rejoice in the Lord, and we respond. And it also helps that everything worked out and we got everything decorated and it was fine. The God of peace guards us with his peace and with his presence. Number two on your notes, the God of peace strengthens you. The God of peace strengthens you. This might sound like an odd juxtaposition, peace and strength. But as we will see, it is the God of peace's presence in our life. Think about just that, that for a moment. If you have kids, if you're a parent, you have f f uh, kids living in your home, are you someone who, when you enter into the space, are you bringing peace or are you bringing chaos? If you're a Christian in this building this morning, when you enter into a room, whether it be at work, at home, or, or the grocery store, when you enter into a space, are you bringing peace or are you bringing chaos? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers 
for what? They will be called sons of God. They're reflecting the, the very image of who God is. The God of peace, his presence in our life strengthens our mind and our will. Two things I want you to notice in these next two verses. Verse 8, the God of peace strengthens us with his presence when our mind is aligned with his. Look at verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Remember, the, the spiral of despair, the negativity, the anxiety, that's what gets us into this problem in the first place. Paul says, change, shift, point your mind somewhere else. Think about these things. The battle of the heart begins in the mind. The culture understands this taking something that was completely taboo 25 years ago, 30 years ago, slowly implementing it into, into society, into life, getting people to laugh at sin, breaking down walls, breaking down barriers, getting people to think, well, if I laugh at it, that must mean it's good. Then they begin to accept it as good. That's what the culture is doing. They're, they're, they're in a battle for your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. That's what they're doing, right? They're conforming us to this world. But be renewed, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In our passage in Philippians, Paul says, finally. This is a stronger word than than so then. It, It carries a stronger emphasis. And he says, finally, think about these things. That that verb think about, take into account. It means to ponder to give proper weight to, to allow the resultant appraisal to influence the way we live. What are we to think about? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The enemy wants us to focus on lies, He wants us to focus on what's wrong, the negativity. The the enemy wants us to spiral out of control and focus on the ugly. The enemy wants sin to capture our hearts, to pressure our minds, and to cultivate a graveyard in our mind. God wants something better. Paul would write to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 6 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. Then he would go on to give the, the armor of God. What's the very thing that protects our mind? It's the helmet of salvation. The thing that, that's unchangeable. If we are in Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. If we are in Christ, no one can snatch us out of his hand. We, we can have assurance of that salvation. It protects our mind. Think about these things, whatever is true, just, right, noble, good, beautiful. Focusing on the truth of who God is and what he has done. Focusing on the beauty of the goodness and his grace. This is the mind that is strong against the enemy. This is the mind that is living by faith. This is the mind that that turns to the cross no matter the circumstance because you recognize that you are not enough. Because we're not. We're not enough. He is. It's it's that shift of perspective. It's not a matter of how much work you do, no matter how much energy or effort you try, no matter how much strength you think you have. You are not good enough. You are not strong enough. But He is. The second thing that these verses highlight is about our actions. Paul's letters always follow a pattern. First, the indicatives, the, intru- the, the truths of who God is, followed by the commands or the imperatives. And so first, he gives the truth of, the, of God that leads us to follow and obey his word. And so letter B, the God of peace strengthens us with his presence when our mind is aligned with his, and letter B, when our actions are aligned to his word. Look at verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Do you have the practice of when you're reading the scripture, when something's repeated over and over again, be like, hmm, that's probably important. Think about how many times Paul says to, to, to recognize these things, right? Whatever you have learned, received, 
heard, seen, right? He's, he's talking about the same thing. He just said it four different times, right? Just like when you're talking to your child, don't stick the thing into the, the electrical socket, right? Don't do that. Don't put it in. Don't pretend to put it in. Don't play around it, right? You're saying it 900 times. And what does the kid do? What, this? <laughs> like this? Don't do this? Yeah, don't do that. He's talking about the good news of Jesus. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about godliness. Practice, pursue these things. Peter says it the same way in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at this verse. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Just pause right there as we read this. His divine power. How powerful is God? All powerful. How sovereign is God? Completely sovereign. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life He says, I have come not to uh, to steal, kill, and destroy, but that you might have life and life abundantly, right? He wants you to have abundant life. He has given us all things, granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? In, in, In what way? Through the knowledge of him who called us. Does that mean I just need to know things about who God is? No, no, no. This is a personal, intimate knowledge. This is a personal, intimate relationship with God through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, notice just, just a moment for it with me. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain for, to life and godliness. Because of this, For this reason, Christian, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Wait a second. What do you mean? If he's given me all things, why do I got to work at it? Hasn't he given me all things? Yeah, but he calls you to draw close to him. He calls you to pursue him. He calls you to, to walk in his word. So pursue it. For this very reason, because it's through the knowledge of him, it's through our relationship with Christ that, that he has granted to us all things through that pertain to life and godliness. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Live it out in virtue with knowledge, deep in your relationship with Christ, and knowledge self-control. Say no to your sinful flesh, and self-control with steadfastness. Keep running in steadfastness, godliness. Godliness, brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For in these qualities, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. Too many people think the Christian life is walking an aisle, saying a prayer, and then going on about your merry way and never thinking about God again. But it's not what the Christian life's all about. Christian life is all about growing closer to Jesus, becoming more like Christ. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that, that he who justifies you will glorify you, that we are, all things are working together for our good, that we might be conformed, made more like Jesus. When the circumstances are hard, the world is collapsing around you, are you going to throw your hands up in the air and question where is God, or are you going to drive yourself towards Jesus? Confirm your calling and election. Pursue godliness. Not moralism. We're not about that. We're about godliness. Paul tells the Philippians, practice these things. And the promise is the best part. Do this, right? Do this, and here's the promise. The God of peace will be with you. I like how one commentator wraps up these verses. It will be on the screen. You can read along with me. He says, God's peace especially resides in those who have ordered their lives in accordance with God's will. This includes proper disciplined thoughts and good Christian living. Thus, the two sets of instructions on peace complement each other. When anxiety appears, the cure is prayer. When life is disorderly, the cure is mental and practical discipline. 
There is no hope in this world. There is no peace in this world. As C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, God cannot give happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing. Peace is the reality that is given to us in salvation. We have peace with God. Peace is also the reality that God is calling us to live in because we have peace with God. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of peace. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Run to the cross of Jesus. Recognize your inability to solve your own problem. Recognize that you are not smart enough, good enough, strong enough, but God is. God is good enough. He is strong enough. He is smart enough. And he has called you to himself. He's got you right where he wants you. He's working in you and through you for his glory and for your good. And he graciously gives you life and peace and satisfaction in himself. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a good and gracious God. We thank you that you love us. You sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, taking the penalty that we deserved. But God, you didn't just die for us and then leave us to our own practices, but you gave us life in your name and you say, come to me and I will give you rest. I did not come that you would be uh, broken. I came that you would be fixed. I came that you would be whole. I came that you would have abundant life in me. So God, I know that there are many in this room who are anxious. I know that there are many in this room who have a spirit of anxiety or fear or worry. But God, you call us to yourself. You see, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. God, help us to to see the circumstances of life. Help us to see the situations that we face. Help us to rejoice in you. Help us to respond graciously and kindly. Help us respond generously. Help us to respond like Christ would. Letting our reasonableness be made known to everyone. God, help us to retreat in prayer, lifting up our our heart, our mind, our soul, pouring out our heart, our fears, our worries, laying them at your feet, knowing that you are a God who is in control of all things. God, help us to focus on the good in this world of who you are, that you are good, that you are true, you are just, You are noble and pure and beautiful. God, help us to practice these things. Help us to live this life for you. Help us to go out of this world, or go out of this building, go out into the world, proclaiming the goodness of God. May the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, because our circumstances are still there. But God, it will guard us because we are in you. So God, help us to live out that, help us to live out our faith. We thank you, we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.